Hi, I'm Russ Briault with the Shroud of Turin Education Project, and welcome to the Shroud Report. And today my guest is historian Dan Scavoni. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Russ. Well, I'm a, really glad to be here. Well, it's Thank a pleasure you. to have you. And uh, Dan is a longtime researcher on the Shroud. I've been studying it for at least 20 years. And um, now, now, Dan, today we, we could, there's so much to talk about with the history of the Shroud and where it's been over its, over its long history. And, and, uh, but but your, your area of Shroud history that, that, that you're focusing on now is, is this very curious relationship, or a, should I say a possible relationship, yeah. between the Shroud of Turin and the Holy Grail. And that's fascinating. Actually, I stumbled upon it. I got interested in King Arthur um, and the Grail. I began reading the uh, major Arthurian legends. There are about six or seven major ones and a lot of offshoots, spin-offs. And uh, I started to notice some relationships. And uh, it, it, it may, mainly uh, revolves around the person of Joseph of Arimathea. So... Now, now, Joseph is the biblical character. The biblical character. That, that now, from my history, if I recollect this right, Joseph was the was the man, at least related to the shroud, who exactly. actually purchased the shroud exactly. that Jesus was wrapped in. Yeah. And 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 okay. Well, as you say, and as as I, I suppose everyone knows, um, Joseph is not in the New Testament until Good Friday. Uh, he comes out of the woodwork. He makes a cameo appearance. Um, all of uh, Jesus' friends, relations, disciples are afraid. They're gone. Mary, his mother, is beside herself. So who's going to take care of the burial? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know I'm, I'm putting this into simplistic terms. Sure. But, um, here comes Joseph. He's a rich man. Uh, some people even think he had been the uncle of Mary. Oh. I don't know how, in what way, but anyhow, it's, that's a later interpolation. Uh, anyway, he comes and he's bought a cloth. It's a, a standard type of burial cloth for Jews of the time of Christ. And uh, he takes Jesus down from the cross, and, he, and he's also got a tomb nearby Golgotha, where the cross was. Mm -hmm. and he it's actually puts, his, his tomb that he had... It's his family tomb. The family tomb, okay. Yeah. It hasn't been used yet. So he uh, wraps Jesus in the cloth and he puts him in the tomb and then bye-bye, we don't see him anymore. But for some reason, this Joseph is one of the hit stars <laughs> of the apocryphal literature that follows the, that follows the New Testament now, now chronologically. What, what is apocryphal yeah, mean? It means taken from being hidden, coming out from being hidden. It, it's a a large a body of literature, I, could, I would bet you would find 2,000 pages mm -hmm. of literature uh, that comes from different parts of the Middle East, Alexandria, um, Coptic, Coptic texts, uh, Syria, um, Eastern Turkey, and so forth. Coptic uh, uh, meaning Armenia, Egyptian, right? Cop Coptic, okay. Christian, Egyptian. Okay. Armenia, for example. And uh, all this literature is either a, a takeoff on the New Testament, well it is, and then it embellishes. Mm -hmm. And it embellishes sometimes in fantastic ways, uh, stories that, of miracles that are even more miraculous than the New Testament miracles. And also um, it sometimes adds historical details that if you're, if you're looking for them, they're very important. In any case, we don't need to find the historical details here. We just need to u see what's in the apocryphal books. Uh, they date from the same time as the New Testament, maybe mm -hmm. the, uh, a late first century all the way to the sixth century. Mm -hmm. And they became part of a Christian literature. Um, and as you may know, sometime in the second century, um, a group of Orthodox uh, church fathers came together and hammered out, so to speak, that canon of 27 or so books of the New Testament. They excluded many for unorthodox doctrines by, by the second century. Christianity's necessary teachings were in place, and the books that they included in the New Testament naturally had to not, not it could not have deviated from the orthodox. Mm -hmm. So, but then all the rest became apocryphal. 
Some of them were hounded out, went into hiding, only to be revealed to us today or mm -hmm. you know, over the centuries. What are, what are some of the names of these apocryphal works? Uh, well, there's a body of apocrypha surrounding the, uh, the um, disciple Thomas, mm -hmm. uh, the doubting Thomas. There's a body, a large body, uh, surrounding uh, John, the beloved. Mm -hmm. um, there's a Gospel of Peter. There's an Acts of John, a Gospel of John, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so um, those are the sorts of things. And, and they, they relate to the New Testament, but then they, em they embellish and, uh, and add, they add new things. So it's in this literature, Joseph of Arimathea, who has, I don't know, two verses or two, a chapter or two in, in, in the four Gospels, uh, he comes to the fore and he becomes a star. So uh, Joseph uh, is captured by the Jews. Now, this one's called the Gospel of Nicodemus. Okay. And it's been dated by different scholars from the 2nd to the 6th century. It's an apocryphal book. So in this book, Joseph is captured by the Jews because he was a Christian. And he's thrown into a cell. And when he's in his cell, um, Jesus, who either has already resurrected, probably has already resurrected, comes to him and enters. And Joseph says, who are you? And Jesus says, don't you know who I am? Come on, I'll show you the tomb where you placed me and the shroud that you laid me in. This is already after mm -hmm. the New Testament. One of the early texts that, that makes the shroud important. And, and he shows Joseph these things and Joseph says, you're, you're the Lord, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, like, duh. And um, so then um, after Je uh, Jesus then teaches him the secrets of the faith, we don't know what that is, what mm -hmm. that meant, because the faith is the faith, okay. And uh, then angels come and lift the, the, the room up by all four corners, and Joseph strolls out, and when the Jews come back the next day, they find that, he, he's not there, right. and, and Caiaphas is still standing there with the key. Everything is locked. So it's a Caiaphas, real mystery. which you know. is the high priest at that time. Yes. Right. Uh -huh. okay. So this is really a mystery for them. They find him in his house. So they, now they wonder. What Nicodemus they find in his no, house. No, Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea, yeah. okay. Find him in his house. And he tells him the story. And all of a sudden, they, they got more respect for him. <laughs> and, of course, they... Uh, I guess some of them must go into a conversion mode, you know, and, and realize that Jesus is uh, something like the real thing. But that's the uh, Gospel of uh, Nicodemus. Okay. So now, when I read the Grail stories, we read the same thing. Where do these Grail writers of the, uh, of the decades just before 1200 and just after 1200 A.D., so 600 years or more later, mm -hmm. Where would they have gotten the story? Joseph was taken prisoner by the Jews, put in a jail. Jesus came to him, taught him the mysteries, did not release him, gave him the grail, which was the cup of the Last Supper, oh. the grail. And Joseph has got it. Um, so the grail legends are basically based on this gospel of Nicodemus, yes. is what you're saying, which is the whole, yeah. okay. Exactly. And I don't know the Gospel of Nicodemus, except I, I, I spotted the shroud in it, mm -hmm. and I was doing shroud research. Right. Then I'm reading these other things, and I see it. I mean, it's something is falling into your lap here, you know, my lap here. Uh, anyway, in this account, Jesus doesn't release Joseph, gives him the grail instead. This is about 30, 30 32, whatever, A.D. Mm -hmm. In the year 70, uh, uh, Vespasian... And his son Titus came to Jerusalem, and it, and the effect did brought brought about that terrible sacking of the city. No, Vespasian was who? The Roman emperor. He was the Roman emperor. And, okay. And, yeah, he and uh, he was the father. Titus was his son, and Domitian was the other son. But Titus was the son who followed his father in the Middle East, and was responsible for the sacking of Jerusalem. In Rome, there's a triumphal arch at one end of the Forum of Rome. And if, if you walk through it, you'll see carvings on the inside of the arch, and they represent the triumphal, re it's called the Arch of Titus. Mm -hmm. they, it represents the triumphal return of Titus and the wagon loads of booty and treasure that he brought from Jerusalem 
which he had sacked. I mean, it's a terrible event in the history of Judaism, right. you know, and it's major. Uh, and and one of the uh, the treasures that he's got back in a wagon is a seven branch candlestick just lying on its side, you know, but you can see it clearly, and it tells the story of what he just did. Well, anyway, Vespasian is in the story. He has just been healed of leprosy in, in the in the Grail account. In the Grail legend, Vespasian. Oh, the... It's new in new additions. Okay. Okay. He has been. Um, healed of leprosy by touching the cloth of Veronica with the miraculous face of Jesus on it. Oh. It's known, a story known to Catholics and many others, you know, that uh, as Jesus was walking, uh, carrying the cross uh, on Calvary, um, a lady came and took pity on him and wiped his face, and he gave her the great gift of uh, the image. It's, a, it's a, another miraculous image, which, by the way, we think is a spin-off of the Shroud. Of the shroud. So we don't, in other words, we think that that's just kind of a story to explain how the shroud image yeah. got there. Yeah. We mm -hmm. don't necessarily think that there is a, a separate Veronica. Well, interesting, no. I, I read we where, don't. I read once where the, where the name Veronica comes from the term vera icon, yeah. meaning true, true likeness. Icon. Exactly. And, and that's how the shroud was described or early on was the yeah. true likeness of Christ. Yeah. Okay. Well, not to go into it in any detail, but if you would, you would see that the Veronica story is probably a version of the Edessa story, the story that uh, we we or will need to go into, or you will, with another historian, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, uh, by which uh, Jesus wipes his face with a cloth and miraculously leaves uh, his face on it. That Edessa image, we now think, evolved into the shroud as a right. fold, you know, the face only folded with the shroud folded behind right. it, okay? Let's hope I'm not going too, too far afield here, but... Okay. Um, anyway, uh, one uh, fourth century writer, by the way, uh, called uh, Macarius of Magnesia in Asia Minor, uh, refers to Veronica as a princess of Edessa. Hot clue. Oh, so what now is? you're linking the Veronica with Edessa, which is where uh, historians such as yourself believe the shroud was mm -hmm. before it ever came to Western Europe and France. Yes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So well, these things are mysteriously tied together. But we may not be able to sort out, you know, the person who ch made the change, but the change was made. Well, anyway, to come back to um, uh, Joseph in his, in his cell, Vespasian was so the reason he came in in the Grail story is to punish the Jews for what they had done to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And when he was there after sacking the city, he asked around for anybody who knew Jesus or who had anything associated with him. And somebody <laughs> said, "There's a guy in a jail there. He's been there 40 years. I think you're 70 now. He's been there 40 years, and uh, he knew Jesus, and he was in prison for being a friend." So Vespasian finds him. And the prison now is in a deep dungeon uh, down in, in the earth. So he has himself lowered down there, and he sees Joseph, and he's robust. I mean, he's only got the grail. He's, he's shaved, you know, clean, and everything. And the grail has sustained him all these years. And he doesn't know that 40 years has passed. So he says, hey, what's going on out there? Uh, so uh, this station releases him. And now Joseph starts on a journey with the Grail. He gathers uh, people around him, uh, fellow Christians, and uh, they start to head west. They're going to go to lands uh, far to the west. Well, when they get to the sea, Joseph hands the cup to his sister and her husband. Her husband's name is Bran or Bran. Okay. Or, um, or Hebron. Okay. And Joseph goes back to live out his days at home, and the others go across. In subsequent versions of the same story, Joseph goes with and okay. becomes a, 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 an evangelist of. Uh, of so there are there are there is this 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 kind of basic Grail legend, yeah. and then there are other versions right. of the Grail right. legend that that other writers have kind of embellished and added to, yeah. and yeah. okay. It was a living legend with, with vague sources. Some of them are not so vague because we spot this mm -hmm. Gospel of Nicodemus, for example. Uh, that, but others felt free to, uh, to 
change them. King Arthur, for example, in all those Arthurian stories, are constantly undergoing change. It's almost the nature of the beast. So we see him now in Richard Gere in the, the latest uh, Arthur movie, uh -huh, uh -huh. and so forth. And the story changes, and the scenes change, and but the Arthur has always been undergoing change for all these centuries since somebody created him. And that's another, well, that's a whole other book. I, I okay. want to hear more about King Arthur, but we're going to be right back in just a minute with the Shroud Report. This really is fascinating. Hi, I'm Russ Brialt with the Shroud Report. Welcome back. And my guest today is Dan Scavoni, historian, longtime researcher on the Shroud of Turin. Uh, thanks again for being here, Dan. Thank you, Russ. And, okay, we've been talking about this interesting relationship between the Shroud of Turin and the Holy Grail. And I, I'm still not quite sure I uh, understand the, the relationship between the two. I'm trying to dramatize it a little bit. And, and, and retain the mystery and the mm -hmm. enigma here of this question that we're, we're dealing with. But here, here was one of the first clues. The first writer of the Grail stories was named Chrétien de Troyes, a Frenchman. Uh, he introduced the word Grail into the literature. Uh, some, sometime around when uh, Chrétien was writing, around 1200 A.D., uh, it was many years after uh, the Gospel of Nicodemus, for example, but around when he was writing, um, a, uh, a priest named Helinan de F of uh, Fouadma <laughs> um, described the grail as deri the word grail as deriving from a Latin word gradalis or gradale, which meant gradual. And then he said the reason they called it a grail was that it, it was a dish that food was brought into banquets on uh, in, uh, in stages. Mm -hmm. So you got the salad, the meat and what have you, you know. Mm -hmm. That was mm -hmm. the way he described it. So a gradual meal, as it were. Okay. So it's interesting that, and I, I think it uh, relates to uh, what I have to say uh, next. But uh, so anyway, Christian died before he finished uh, his uh, account of the Grail, and uh, he had four continuators who, in the next ten or twenty years, tried to finish the story that he had begun. Mm -hmm. The first continuator is the most important. An interpolator, someone who added to the first continuator, it's, it's complicated, okay? Mm -hmm. But someone who added to the first continuator told a story about Joseph of Arimathea, mm -hmm. our star, right. and Nicodemus um, getting ready to take Jesus down from the cross and bury him. Because Nicodemus was there in, in the Gospel of John, mm -hmm. and uh, only. And so, but Nicodemus said, wait, I want to make an image of Jesus as he is, so I'll remember, have it to remember. And he started to sculpt the face of Jesus. Then this text right goes, first continuator, interpolator. Um, but God had a hand in making this face because it could not be made by the hand of man. Mm. Now, as uh, Shroud uh, scholars know, that expression, not made by human hands, is one of the main descriptors of the Shroud of Turin. Right. of the Edessa cloth and then mm -hmm. later of the Shroud of Turin. Mm -hmm. So here's our first link okay, uh, between the Grail and the Shroud. It's Joseph who is only identified with the Shroud of Jesus in the New Testament, uh, now has the, is going to have the Grail. Mm -hmm. okay. um, in, in, the same, um, in the same account, Joseph first goes to Pilate to get permission to take the body of Jesus mm -hmm. down. This is just before this episode with Nicodemus. And Pilate gives him the permission and then says, by the way, somebody picked up this cup from the table where Jesus was meeting with his disciples yesterday, Thursday, mm -hmm. and uh, he gave it to me, but I don't have use for it, so you're a Christian, you take it. Joseph has got the grail, which contained the wine that Jesus had changed into his holy blood mm -hmm. in his hand now. So he's got the shroud that he bought, and he's got the grail. They go to Golgotha, and when they get there, they see that Jesus' body is dripping. This is all in the Holy Grail stories of 1200. Okay. And he sees the body dripping blood, and he runs up and catches the blood in the grail. 
So not only did it have the symbolic blood of Jesus, but also the real blood. Mm -hmm. Now that's a key element in all the Grail stories from this time on. Joseph captured it. Some of the books begin with, after Joseph captured Jesus' blood in the Grail, and then, and then they go on. So it's, it's main, major. Okay, okay. so um, the next thing I think that I, I want to bring in starts with a, a ritual that is in the legends of the Edessa face subsequently known as the Holy Shroud. Mm -hmm. in this the, region, Edessa, the Edessa cloth was discovered around early 6th uh, century and, yeah. and has this face image on it. And yeah. people, scholars, believe that this Edessa cloth found in, the, in around 525 A.D. is the same cloth as the Shroud of Turin. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, anyway, um, this ritual that is associated with that cloth somehow forgets that it's just a face. And it says, on Easter Sunday in Edessa, this is before 944 A.D., because in that year, that cloth left Edessa. Mm -hmm. So all this is before 944. And of course, it, it, if it's, there's anything to it, it foils the carbon date by carbon right. dating of the Shroud by mm -hmm. centuries. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, in, at the first hour of the morning, they would raise it out of its case. It was kept secretly. I and see. nobody was allowed near it mm -hmm. to get a close-up. They would take it out of its case a little bit, and it would look like an infant. At the third hour, like 10 o'clock, they would take, or 9, they would raise it a little bit more, and it would look like a little boy. At the sixth hour, they would take it out a little bit more, and it would look like a young man. And at the ninth hour, which is about 3 o'clock, would, they would raise it to its full length, and it would... Uh, uh, and it would look like the so it the kind of symbolizes Jesus the whom, different yeah. stages of of Christ's yeah. life as he's from infancy to adulthood and, yeah. and okay and what kind of change is it gradual gradual change okay. okay and finally you see Jesus as he was when he was crucified on the cross so that's so a they hint. would raise up the cloth and you'd see the and you'd see the 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 full frontal image that's on yes. the shroud. That's what I think. Okay. It's, it's a hint that the face in Edessa was always a full body image. Right. And that, right. that text goes back to the 10th century. Okay. So the, the key word here is gradual. Yeah. This and whole it, gradual unfolding of the shroud yeah. during this kind of ceremony where they're symbolically showing the life of Christ. Yeah. Okay. Now, after the, after the shroud left Edessa and was taken to Constantinople, which was in 944, Soon after that, in the Byzantine Mass, a, a new um, uh, Eucharistic uh, service was introduced called melismos. Mm -hmm. Melismos comes from the Greek word uh, melidzane, meaning to cut. Mm -hmm. And this is what it involved. And we have um, a, a picture to show. Okay. Uh, these are murals that de depict the, the uh, Byzantine uh, liturgical services. What they did was to bring... So what am I looking at okay, here then? You're looking at a, an altar uh, uh, at a Byzantine mass. It contains a chalice for the wine mm -hmm. and a paten for the bread. In the Byzantine service, they use a, uh, 11 loaf of bread, mm -hmm. loaf, mm -hmm. unlike the Catholic Roman uh, un unleavened bread wafer. So they would bring out a cloth that had an image of the infant Jesus on it. And let me show you another picture here. Um, if we uh, look at that uh, lower picture, mm -hmm. you'd see just another example of many murals that show this uh, melismo service. There's the baby Jesus lying in the platter. L lying. So you have, an, you have an image then of... It's a, really a cloth over the bread. Cloth over in, the in bread. In the service, but the, the, image, the, uh, but the murals show the actual baby. Okay. okay. Then what happens is the, the celebrant of the service takes a knife which is called a lanke in Greek, which means a lance. Mm -hmm. It's part of the, uh, the Arturian uh, symbolism. And he cuts right through the baby to cut through the morsel, the bread into the morsels for communion. The baby is pierced, hmm. okay? Then, when communion is distributed, what, what is communion? It's the body of the crucified. So mm -hmm. the child, in this whole melismo symbolism, has changed gradually, if you wish, from the child to the crucified and communion. I see. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that that is a, um, 
um, an extension of that ritual from Edessa. Now, is there is there any child relation to man? Okay, from know? child to man, the whole the whole gradual thing. Gradual yeah. meaning the belief that 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 the word Grail actually derives from, from the this. word gradual. Yes. Exactly. Okay, because so actually, that's the tie. because it's I, vague. I, I okay, it's because I, I remember reading where no one really knows what the word Grail means. That's right, and and that's why we're looking at kind of where that word may have been derived from. Yeah, Helenand had his own use of his own meaning of the word, mm -hmm. and in a way, it may have uh, you know meant that as well. Now, now, but do it you also it also resonates back to this. Now, do you think that these pictures we just looked at with the with the with the chalice? with the baby in the chalice or the, in the platter, does that yeah. somehow relate back to the idea that the shroud having an image on it? Um, I'm not sure about that, but let me tell you what it does relate to. Okay. okay? In the Grail stories, it's a story of a quest, a quest for this thing. We don't know exactly what it is, but it's a platter in some, and it's a cup in some stories. But the, when the the perfect knight is born and comes to knighthood, Sir Galahad. He's perfect. Not only has he never committed a sin, he's never been tempted. <laughs> okay. Good for him. Uh, but anyway, he's so perfect. So God gives him the blessing of achieving, that's the word is, achieving the grail. And when he does, and he looks into it, what does he see? The infant Jesus is in there, and as he looks, it changes into the crucified Jesus. That is the meaning, the bottom line meaning of the grail. And he goes, now I may die because I have achieved this beatific vision. And he dies. You know, he dies after seeing he it. He dies after seeing and it. And he sees this baby in changing the chalice to, changing gradually, this whole yeah. gradual thing again. It's the same as we're, we're okay. seeing on the okay. screen. Okay, okay. So the final, the final element in attaching, in my uh, seeing, so many Shroud of Turin resonances with the Grail is this. The, the Grail is focused in Britain, and it's associated with King Arthur and his knights. How did it get to Britain? Mm -hmm. how, how did the idea of the Grail get to Britain, especially if it's the Shroud? Mm -hmm. okay. Well... I find the text, all of this is by accident. I find the text, I've studied some German writers, biblical writers, and they said, um, uh, Clement of Alexandria, in a little known writing of his, uh, wrote a story about where did the disciples of Jesus go and where did they finally die? Mm -hmm. And he tells Peter and Paul in Rome and things we know, you know, Thomas in India, for example, and then he says, <clears throat> Jude Thaddeus, who is a factor in the Edessa story in bringing the face of the miraculous face of Jesus to the king of Edessa, mm -hmm. okay. Thaddeus was buried in Britium of the Edessenes. Oh, Britium, Britium of the Edessenes. Okay. A British writer. Sounds like Britain. Another name for Edessa was this, it was named for the citadel, like mm -hmm. Athens has an Acropolis. Mm -hmm. this, the word citadel in Syriac, the local language, was birtha. When you translate that into Greek or Latin, it becomes Britium in Latin and Brition in Greek. Like Clement was writing in Greek. Okay. So uh, uh, an important church writer who wrote an ecclesiastical history of the church in Britain was Venerable Bede. The Bede found this text and thought it meant Britain. Britain. Yeah. So what you're saying then is that the whole legend the surrounding story the shra of the grail plunked down in Britain. Being in Britain was as a result of a translation error yeah. n incorrectly translating Britium yeah. to Britain. Yeah. That's fascinating. So uh, there's a, yet one other text if I can get it right now, I was trying to remember it, but it's kind of hazy. I wrote this a while back. Um, in an, another accident of my research, uh, in a book called the Liber Pontificalis, the Book of the Popes, which contains short biographies, what was known later on in the 6th or 7th century about the early popes, 
Peter and others. Uh, in this book of the popes, uh, there is a pope of the second century, lived around 200, and his name was uh, Eleutherus. Mm -hmm. And in this story, Eleutherus, it's, it's just says, there's about ten lines on him, but one of the things he did was he, he, uh, he received a letter from the king of Britium, whose name was Lucius, mm -hmm. in the third century, 200. There was no king in Britain in the third century because it was a Roman province. Okay. okay. Who is Lucius? Come to find out. The king of Edessa, who is known always as Abgar, right. okay, had contacts with Rome. And these um, client kings often honored the local, the, the present emperor, by taking their name. Abgar's name on his coins is Lucius Megas the Great, Abgarus. So there was a Lucius, and was he a king of Britain? No, he was a king of Britium, or another name for Edessa. It's uncanny. And the key relationship here is that the shroud is linked with Edessa. And is linked with Joseph of Arimathea. And with and Joseph of Arimathea. With Grail. Okay. Uh, so, you know, by a complicated series of accidents, I think, it's solid. It's really solid. The grail is the shroud. And the other thing about uh, the, the Joseph of Arimathea was that the grail legends show him going up to the side of the cross and collecting the blood in the chalice. Thank you. Thank you for prompting that. And then, but, yeah. but the actual version is what? The final thing. I almost forgot. Thank you. We've talked before. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have. Okay. Anyway, I find a manuscript from Russian Georgia. And it says, and it starts out, I, Joseph, sort of like a first person, I, Joseph, went to Golgotha to take down the body of the Lord and place him in the shroud and in, in my tomb. And I saw that his, this is by the fifth century now, and I saw that he was, the blood was dripping from his body. And I rushed up and captured the blood. Remember where he captured it in the 12th century? In the grail. The original of that is, I captured his blood in the shroud. In the shroud. The shroud, the grail has taken the place of the shroud in 1200. The shroud is there in 500 in this manuscript. Then it becomes the grail. So, I don't know how many links we've established, but I think, I think they're sufficient to make, if the shroud is not precisely, literally, the grail, it is that object which inspired the quest for the Holy Grail. Well, it certainly is fascinating, and I know you're continuing your your research on it. I and um, and uh, I find it fascinating. <laughs> you must. Well, this has been wonderful, and uh, we're going to take a break, and we'll be right back in just a minute. I'm Russ Brialt, and uh, welcome back to the Shroud Report. And um, we've been talking today with historian Dan Scavoni. And Dan, it's been a, a pleasure having you here. This fascinating relationship between the Shroud and the Grail. And, Thanks, Russ. And it, um, it's. Uh, I'm glad to get it out on the table. It's a good story, and I think it's a new history. Well, it, it certainly is symbolic there's this whole notion of the of the quest for the holy grail and yet in the whole relationship with the shroud of turin all the different avenues of 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 research be it uh, science or history or archaeology or all the d different aspects that have been brought to bear in the research of the shroud really trying to find trying to solve the mystery of the shroud is almost like trying to find the holy grail isn't it yeah exactly so it I couldn't have put it better myself. Seems, seems apropos. Thank you very much, Dan. Thanks, Russ. It was good. Thank and, you. And thanks for you, and we'll see you next time on the Shroud Report.